have come to the conclusion that one useless man is called a disgrace, that two are called a law firm, <laughs> and that three or more become a Congress. And by God, I have had this Congress. For 10 years, King George and his parliament have galled, cullied, and diddled these colonies with their illegal taxes, stamp acts, Townsend acts, sugar acts, tea acts. And when we dared stand up like men, they stopped our trade, seized our ships, blockaded our ports, burned our towns, and spilled our blood. And yet this Congress refuses to grant any of my proposals on independence, even so much as the courtesy of open debate. Good God, what in the hell are they waiting for? Sit down, John, sit down. that you have John Adams to abuse, for no sane man would tolerate it. John, you're a bore. We've heard this before. Now, for God's sake, John, sit down. I say, but yes. No. But yes. No. But for independence. open up a window. I say, but yes. Sit John. But for independence. Will someone shut that man up? Never! Never! Dear God, for one solid year, they have been sitting there, a whole year, doing nothing. I do believe you've laid a curse on North America. A curse that we here now rehearse in Philadelphia. A second flood, a simple famine, plagues of locusts everywhere. Or a cataclysmic earthquake, I'd accept with some despair. But no, you sent us Congress. Good God, sir, was that fair? I say this with humility in Philadelphia. Weigh your responsibility in Philadelphia. If you don't want to see us hanging from some far off British hill, if you don't want the voice of independency forever still, then God, sir, get thee to it, for Congress never will. You see, we piddle, twiddle, and resolve. Not one damn thing do we solve. Piddle, twiddle, and resolve. Nothing's ever solved in foul, fetid, fuming, foggy, filthy Philadelphia. Someone ought to open up a window. Oh, shut up! I will now call Congress's attention to the petition of Mr. Melkor Mann, who claims $20 compensation for his dead mule. It seems the animal was employed transporting luggage in the service of the Congress. Well, the question then would appear to be one of occasion. For if the mule expired not while carrying, but after having been unloaded, then surely the beast died on its own time. Good God! They may sit here for years and years in Philadelphia. These indecisive grenadiers of the Philadelphia. They can't agree on what is right and wrong or what is good or bad. I'm convinced the only purpose this Congress ever had was to gather here specifically 
to drive John Adams mad. You see, we piddle, twiddle, and resolve. Not one damn thing do we solve. Piddle, twiddle, and resolve. Nothing's ever solved in foul, fetid, fuming, foggy, filthy Philadelphia. Abigail, Abigail, I have such a desire to knock heads together. I know, my dearest, I know. But that's because you make everything so complicated. It's quite simple, really. Just tell the Congress to declare independency. Then sign your name, get out of there, and hurry home to me. Our children all have dysentery. Little Tom keeps turning blue. And I'm coming down with flu. They say we may get smallpox. Uh, madam, what else is new? Abigail, in my last letter, I told you the king has collected 12,000 German mercenaries to send against us. I asked you to organize the ladies to make saltpeter for gunpowder. Have you done as I asked? No, John, I have not. Why have you not? Because you neglected to tell us how saltpeter is made. By treating sodium nitrate with potassium chloride, of course. Oh, yes. Of course. Will it be done, then? I'm afraid we have a more urgent problem, John. More urgent, madam? There's one thing every woman's missed in Massachusetts Bay. Don't smirk at me, you egotistic. Heed to what I say. There's a war on, says each tradesman with a grin. Well, we will not make saltpeter until you send us pins. Pins, madam, saltpeter. Pins. Saltpeter. Pins. Saltpeter. Pins. Saltpeter. Pins. Peter. Pins. Peter. Pins. Peter. Pins. Peter. Pins. Peter. Pins. Done, madam. Done. Done, John. Hurry home, John. As soon as I'm able. Don't stop writing. It's all I have. Every day, my dearest friend. Posterity. Do you like it? <laughs> it stinks. As ever, the soul of tact. The man's no Botticelli. <laughs> the subject is no Venus. Franklin, you heard what I suffered in there? Heard? Of course I heard, along with the rest of Philadelphia. Lord, your voice is piercing, John. I wish to heaven my arguments were. Damn it, Franklin, when will they make up their minds? With one hand, they can raise an army, dispatch one of their own to lead it, and cheer the news from Bunker's Hill. And with the other, they wave an olive branch, begging the king for a happy and permanent reconciliation. Damn it, Fat George has declared us in rebellion. Why, in bloody hell, can't they? Really, John, you talk as if independence were the rule. It's never been done before. Never has a colony broken free from its parent stem in the history of the world. Damn it, Franklin, you make us sound treasonous. Do I? Treason. 
Treason is a charge invented by the winners as an excuse for hanging the losers. I have more to do than stand here listening to you quote yourself. Well, that was a new one. <laughs> Damn it, Franklin, we're at war. To defend ourselves, nothing more. We expressed our displeasure. The English moved against us. We, in turn, have resisted. And now our fellow congressmen want to effect a reconciliation before it becomes a war. Reconciliation, my ass. The people want independence. The people have read Mr. Payne's common sense. I doubt the Congress has. Oh, John, why don't you give it up? No one listens to you. You're obnoxious and disliked. I am not promoting John Adams. I'm promoting independence. Evidently, they can't help connecting the two. What are you suggesting? That someone else in Congress propose. Never! Why? Who did you have in mind? Oh, I don't know. I really haven't given it much thought. You sent for me, Benjamin! Never! Hello, Johnny! Richard? Richard, John and I need some advice. Well, if it's mine to give, it's yours. You know that. Oh, thank you, Richard. As you know, the cause which we support has come to a complete standstill. Now, why do you suppose that is? Simple. Johnny here is obnoxious and disliked. <laughs> yes, that's true. Now, what's the solution, I wonder? Well, get someone else in Congress to propose. Richard, that's brilliant. Isn't that brilliant, John? Brilliant. Yes, now the question remains, who can that be? The man we need needs to come from a delegation publicly committed to supporting independence. And at present, only Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Delaware have declared our way. And Virginia, Virginia. You don't forget about Virginia. Oh, I haven't, Richard. How could I? But, strictly speaking, though Virginia's views on independence are well known, your legislature in Williamsburg has yet to formally authorize your delegation to support the cause. Now, if we could think of a Virginian with enough influence to go down there and persuade the House Damn of Damn me if I haven't thought of someone! Who? Me! Why didn't I think of that? I'll leave tonight. Why, hell, I'll leave right now if you like. I'll stop off at Stratford to refresh the missus. <laughs> and then straight to the matter. Virginia! The land that gave us our glorious commander-in-chief. <laughs> George Washington will now give this continent its proposal on independence. And when Virginia proposes, the South is bound to follow. And where the South goes, the middle colonies go. Gentlemen, a salute to Virginia, the mother of American independence. Incredible. We're free, and he hasn't even left yet. What makes you so sure you can do it? Ah! My name is Richard Henry Lee, Virginia is my home. My name is Richard Henry Lee, Virginia is my home. And may my horses turn to glue if I can deliver unto you a resolution on independency. For I am FMV, the first family in the sovereign colony of Virginia. Yes, the FMV, the oldest family in the oldest colony in America. And may the British burn the land if I can't deliver to your hand a resolution on independency. You see, it's here, Ali, there, Ali, everywhere, Ali, Ali. Socially, politically, financially, naturally, internally, externally, fraternally, eternally. The first family in the southern colony of Virginia. And may my wife refuse my bed if I can't deliver, as I said, a resolution on independency. Spoken modestly. God help us. He will, John. He will. They say that God in heaven is everybody's God. Amen. I'll admit that God in heaven is everybody's God. But I tell you, John, with pride, God leans a little on the side of the leaves, the leaves of old Virginia. You see, it's here, there, Lee, and Willie Lee, and Richard H. 
That's me! And may my blood stop running blue If I can't deliver unto you A resolution on independency Yes, oh my God, it's clearly display I've ever witnessed. There are warm-blooded people, Virginia. Not him, Franklin. You. You and your infernal obsession for deviousness. If you'd come right out and ask him straight, he'd have been gone a half hour ago. Oh, cheer up, John. Our cause is once again riding high, sitting straight in the saddle, and at full gallop for Virginia. And our women are serene. Full bosom. Full bosom. A oh, full bosom, Benji. Everyone a queen. Cause at least, damn it, please in all Virginia. Yes, I'm a guy. Dr. Lyman Hall, the new delegate from Georgia? No, oh, I'm Andrew McNair, congressional custodian. If you've been eating anything at all, it's Yon McNair like you hear the others doing, and then you won't have a long time to wait. And where does the Georgia delegation belong? Oh, they, they mill around over there near the two Carolinas. It's after 10. I was told Congress convenes at 10. Yeah, they'll be wandering in any time now with old Grape and Guts leading the pack. Old who? McNair! Grape and Guts. Fetch me a mug of rot. Mr. Hopkins, you'll be pleased to meet Dr. Lyman Hall. I don't need a doctor, damn it. New delegate from Georgia? Oh, why didn't you say so? Huh. I'm Stephen Hopkins, old delegate from Rhode Island. McNair, two months are wrong. Oh, no, I, I fear it's a little oh, early in the day. Nonsense. It's a medicinal fact that rum gets a man's heart started in the morning. I'm surprised you didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and speaking as the oldest man in the Congress, ben I must Franklin's say... Franklin's older by uh, almost a year. Wrong! Tell me, Doctor, where does Georgia stand on the question of independence? With South Carolina, of course. <laughs> Good morning, Nettie. Shake the hand of Dr. Lyman Hall from Georgia. This here is Edward Rutledge from uh, whichever Carolina he says he's from. Uh, God knows I can't keep him straight. A pleasure, Dr. Hall. Your servant. Now you've met the long and the short of it, Doctor. Nettie here's only 26, the youngest one of us. Except Ben Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> Look there! You rum. Where'd you go for it, man? Jamaica? Dr. Hall, where does Georgia stand on the issue of independence? Well, I'm here without instruction, able to go to my own personal convictions. And they are personal. <laughs> Dr. Hall, the Deep South speaks with one voice. It is traditional, even more, it is historical. Ah, enter the Delaware delegation, tria juncta in uno. 
speak plain of language. You know I cannot follow none of your damn French. Latin, Colonel McKeon, a tribute to the eternal peace and harmony of the Delaware delegation. <laughs> what are you saying, man? You know perfectly well neither Rodney nor I can stand this persistent little war. Gentlemen, this is Dr. Lyman Hall of Georgia, Colonel Thomas McKeon, Caesar Rodney, and George Reed. Sir, where do you stand on independence? Uh, with South Carolina, it seems. Gentlemen, I leave the doctor in your excellent company. Tell me, sir, are you a doctor of medicine or theology? Well, both, Mr. Rodney. Which could be of service? By all means, the physician first, and then we'll see about the other. <laughs> I shall call on you at your convenience. I trust, Caesar, that once you're through converting the poor fellow to independence, that you give the opposition a fair crack at him. Sorry, John. But you're too late. Once I get them, they're got. Dr. Lyman Hall of Georgia, Mr. John Dickinson of Pennsylvania. An honor, sir. Your servant. <clears throat> ah. Oh, Judge Wilson, forgive me. But how can anyone see you when you insist on in hiding in Mr. Dickinson's shadow? James Wilson, also of Pennsylvania. Sir. An honor, sir. Get out of my way, please. Good morning, all. Good heavens, do, do you have the honor of being Dr. Franklin? Yes, I have that honor. Unfortunately, the gout accompanies the honor. You're living too high again, eh, Pappy? Steve and I only wish that King George felt like my big toe. All over. <laughs> <laughs> but now, fetch a pillow. <laughs> and two more mugs are wrong. All right, Franklin, where is that idiot Lee? Has he returned yet? I don't see him. Softly, John, your voice is hurting my foot. <laughs> One more day, Franklin. That's how long I'll remain silent, and not a minute longer. That strut and popinjay was so damn sure of himself, he's had time to bring back a dozen proposals by now. Tired of waiting. Tired. Tell me, James. How do you explain the strange, quad monumental quietude that Congress has been treated to these past 30 days. Has the ill wind of independence finally blown itself out? Well, if you ask me... For myself, I must confess that a month free from New England noise is more therapeutic than a month in the country. Wouldn't you agree, James? Well, I... Tell me, Mr. Adams. Pray, look for your voice. It cannot be far, and God knows we need the entertainment in this Congress. <laughs> Congratulations, John. You just made your greatest contribution to independence. You kept your flat shut. <laughs> One more day, Franklin. Gentlemen, the usual morning festivities concluded. I will now call the Congress to order. Mr. Thompson. <clears throat> The Second Continental Congress, meeting in the city of Philadelphia, is now in session. 7 June 1776, the 380th meeting. Sweet Jesus. The Honorable John Hancock of Massachusetts Bay, President. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. McNair, the stores of rum and other drinking spirits are hereby closed to the colony of Rhode Island for a period of three days. Yes, sir. John, you can't do that. Sit down, Mr. Hopkins. You have abused the privilege. The chair takes this opportunity to welcome Dr. Lyman Hall of Georgia to this Congress and hopes he makes the best of it. My God, it's hot. Uh, the secretary will read the roll. All members present with the following exceptions. Mr. Charles Carroll of Maryland, Mr. Samuel Adams of Massachusetts, Mr. Button Gwinnett of Georgia, Mr. George Wythe and Mr. Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, and the entire delegation of New Jersey. I'm concerned over the continued absence of 113th of this Congress. Where is New Jersey? Uh, somewhere between New York and Pennsylvania. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Franklin, have you heard anything? Your son resides there. Son, sir. What son, sir? The royal governor of New Jersey, sir? As that title might suggest, sir, we are not in touch at the present time. Yes, very well. Um, the weather report, Mr. Jefferson of Virginia. Mr. Jefferson. Uh, present, sir. May we hear about the weather as if it weren't speaking for itself? 87 degrees of temperature, 30.06 inches of mercury, wind from the southwest. And tonight, tonight I leave for home. On business? 
family business. Give her a good one for me, a fella. <laughs> I will, sir. <laughs> From the commander, Army of the United Colonies, in New York. Dispatch number 1137. Sweet Jesus! <clears throat> to the Honorable Congress, John Hancock, President. Dear Sir, it is with grave apprehension that I have learned this day of the sailing from Halifax, Nova Scotia, of a considerable force of British troops in the company of foreign mercenaries and under the command of General Sir William Howe. There can be no doubt that their destination is New York, for to take and hold this city and the Hudson Valley beyond would serve to separate New England from the other colonies, permitting both sections to be crushed in turn. Sadly, I see no way of stopping them at the present time, as my army is absolutely falling apart. My military chest is totally exhausted, my commissary general has strained his credit to the last. My quartermaster has no food, no arms, no ammunition. And my troops are in a state of near mutiny. I pray God some relief arrives before the Armada, but I fear it will not. Your obedient servant. G. Washington. Mr. President. Colonel McKeon. Surely we've managed to promote the gloomiest man on the continent to the head of our troops. Those dispatches are among the most depressing accumulation of disaster, doom, and despair in the entire annals of military history. And furthermore... Please, Colonel McKeon. What? It's too hot. Oh, yes. I, I suppose you're right. General Washington will continue wording his dispatches as he sees fit. And I'm sure we all pray that he finds happier thoughts to convey in the near future. Mr. Thompson, are there any resolutions? Dr. Josiah Bartlett from New Hampshire. Resolved that for the duration of present hostilities, the Congress discourages every type of extravagance and dissipation, elaborate funerals, and other expensive diversions, especially all horse racing. Reggie, I'm back! I'm back, Johnny! Yep, yep, woohoo! Oh, Reacher, we're pleased to see you. What news, Dicky boy? What news? Please. Is it done? Hey, first things first, uh, Tom, where's Tom? Uh, Tom, your little bride wants to know. Know what? When's he coming home? I leave tonight. Never mind that. Is it done? Done? Why, uh, certainly. <laughs> Mr. President, I have returned from Virginia with the following resolution. Resolved that these United Colonies are, and of a right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved. Mr. President, I second the proposal. The resolution has been proposed and seconded. The chair will now entertain debates. Mr. Dickinson. Mr. President, Pennsylvania moves, as always, that the question of independence be postponed indefinitely. I second the motion. Uh -huh. Judge Wilson, in your eagerness to be loved, you seem to have forgotten that Pennsylvania cannot second its own motion. Delaware seconds. You would, you little weasel. The motion to postpone has been moved and seconded. Mr. Thompson. On the motion to postpone indefinitely the resolution of independency or proceed with the debate, all those in favor of debate say yay. All those for postponement say nay. New Hampshire. New Hampshire favors debate and says yay. New Hampshire says yay. Massachusetts. Massachusetts, having borne the brunt of the king's tyranny. Yes, yes I said tyranny! Massachusetts now and for all time says yay. Massachusetts says yay. Rhode Island. Mr. Hopkins, where's Rhode Island? Rhode Island is not visiting the uh, necessary. After what Rhode Island's consumed, I can't say I'm surprised. We'll come back to him, Mr. Thompson. Rhode Island passes. <laughs> Connecticut. Well, Connecticut has till now been against this proposal. Our legislature has instructed me in the event it is introduced by a colony outside of New England 
Connecticut can no longer withhold its support. Connecticut says yay. Connecticut says yay. New York. Mr. Secretary, New York abstains. Courteously. New York abstains. Courteously. New Jersey. Absent, Mr. Secretary. Oh, yes, New Jersey is absent. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, for the 24th time, says nay. Pennsylvania says nay. Delaware. Delaware, as ever for independence, says yay. Delaware says yay. Maryland. Maryland would welcome independence, if it were given, but it is highly skeptical that it could be taken. Maryland says nay. Maryland says nay. Virginia? Virginia, the first colony, says yay. Virginia says yay. North Carolina? North Carolina respectfully yields to South Carolina. South Carolina. Mr. President, although we in South Carolina have never truly entertained the issue of independence, when a gentleman proposes it, attention must be paid. However, we in the Deep South, unlike our northern brethren, have no cause for impatience at the present time. If at some future date it becomes the wish of all our sister colonies to effect a separation, we will not stand in the way. Until then, South Carolina will wait and watch. The vote is nay. South Carolina says nay. North Carolina says, says nay. Yes, Mr. Hughes, I know. <laughs> Georgia. Georgia. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Georgia seems to be split right down the middle on this issue. The people are against it, but I, well, I am for it. I'm afraid, though, that I'm not yet certain whether representing the people means relying on their judgment or my own. So in all fairness, until I can figure that out, perhaps I should lean a little towards their side. Georgia says nay. Georgia says nay. Rhode Island, second call, Rhode Island. I'm coming, I'm coming. Hold your damn horses. We're waiting on you, Mr. Hopkins. I won't kill you. You'd think the Congress would have its own pisser. <laughs> All right, where does she stand? Five for debate, five for postponement, one abstention, and one absence. Ah, so it's up to me, is it? Well, I tell you, in all my years, I never heard, seen, nor smelled an issue that was so dangerous it couldn't be talked about. Hell, I'm for debating anything. Rhode Island says yay. Again, get Mr. Hopkins a rum. But you Get him said... the whole damn barrel if he wants. Ha! The chair now declares this Congress a committee of the whole for the purpose of debating Virginia's resolution of independence. Mr. Dickinson. <clears throat> well, now, you finally got your way at last, Mr. Adams. The matter may now be discussed. I must confess I'm almost relieved. But there's a question I've been fairly itching to ask you. Why? Why what, Mr. Dickinson? Well, why independence, Mr. Adams? For the obvious reason that our continued association with Great Britain has grown intolerable. Intolerable to whom? To you? Well, then I suggest you sever your ties immediately. But please, be so kind as to leave the rest of us where we are. Personally, I have no objection at all to being a part of the greatest empire on Earth, to enjoying its protections and sharing its benefits. Benefits? What benefits, sir? Crippling taxes? Cruel repressions? Abolished rights? Is that all England means to you, sir? Is that all the affection and pride you can muster for the nation that bore you? For the noblest, most civilized nation on the face of this planet? Would you have us forsake Hastings and Magna Carta, Strongbow and Lionheart, and Drake and Marlborough, Tudor, Stuart and Plantagenet? And for what, sir? Tell me, for what? For you? Some men are patriots, like General Washington, and some are anarchists, like Mr. Paine, and some even are internationalists, like Dr. Franklin. But you, sir, you are merely an agitator, disturbing the peace, creating disorder, endangering the public welfare. And for what? 
for your own petty little personal complaints. Your taxes are too high. Well, sir, so are mine. Come, come, Mr. Evans. If you have grievances, and I'm sure you have, our current system must provide a gentler means of redressing them, short of revolution. That is what he wants. Nothing short of it will satisfy him. Violence, rebellion, treason. Now, sir, are these the acts of Englishmen? Not Englishmen, Dickinson, American. No, sir, Englishmen. Oh, please, Mr. Dickinson, must you start begging? How is a man to sleep? <laughs> Forgive me, Dr. Franklin, but must you start speaking? How's a man to stay awake? <laughs> I promise, sir, that we'll remain quiet. Uh, I'm sure everyone prefers that you remain asleep. If I'm to hear myself called an Englishman, sir, then I assure you I prefer that I remain asleep. Now, what's so terrible about being called an Englishman? The English don't seem to mind. Nothing, sir. <laughs> Were I given the full rights of an Englishman, but to be called one without those rights, it's, <laughs> it's like calling an ox a bull. He's thankful for the honor, but he'd much have a, rather have restored what's rightfully his. <laughs> <laughs> Pray tell, sir, when did you first notice they were missing? <laughs> Fortunately, Dr. Franklin, the people of these colonies maintain a higher regard for their mother country. Higher, certainly, than she for them. Never has such a valuable possession been so stupidly and recklessly managed as this entire continent by the British crown. Our industry is discouraged, our resources pillaged, and worst of all, our very character stifled. We've spawned a new race here, rougher, simpler, more violent, more enterprising, less refined, we're a new nationality, Mr. Dickinson. We require a new nation. Yes, well, that may be your opinion, Dr. Franklin, but as I said, the people feel quite differently. <laughs> what do you know of the people, Dickinson? You don't speak for the people. You represent only yourself, and that precious status quo you keep imploring the people to preserve for their own good is nothing more than the eternal preservation of your own property. Mr. Adams, you have an annoying talent for making such delightful words as property seem quite distasteful. In heaven's name, what's wrong with property? Perhaps you've forgotten that many of us first came to these shores in order to secure rights to property, and that we owe those rights no less dear than the rights you speak of. So safe, huh? So fat, so comfortable in Pennsylvania. And what is this independence of yours except the private grievance of Massachusetts? Why is it always Boston that breaks the king's peace? My good Congress, do not adopt this evil measure. It is the work of the devil. Leave it where it belongs, in New England. Brother Dickinson, New England has been fighting the devil for over a hundred years. And as of now, Brother Sherman, the devil has been winning hands down. Why, at this very moment, he sits here in this Congress. Do not let him deceive you. This proposal is entirely his doing. Now, just a it minute. It may bear Virginia's name, but it reeks of Adams, Adams, and more Adams. Look at him sitting there, ready to lead this continent down the fiery path of total destruction. Good God, man, why can't you acknowledge what already exists? It has been more than a year since Concord and Lexington. Damn it, man! We're at war right now! No, sir! No, you may be at war. You, Boston, and John Adams. But you will never speak for Pennsylvania. Nor for Delaware. Mr. Reed, you represent only one third of Delaware. The sensible third, Mr. Rodney. Sit down, you little rush, and I'll knock you down! Sit down, all three of you. McNair, do something about these damn flies. Fetch me a mug of rock. Get the flies first. Run! I've only got two hands. Christ, it's hot. Please do go on, gentlemen. You're making the only breeze in Philadelphia. <laughs> Mr. Adams, perhaps you could clear something up for me. After we have achieved independence. Who would govern in South Carolina? The people, of course. 
But which people, sir? The people of South Carolina or the people of Massachusetts? Why don't you admit it, Nettie? You're against independence now, and you always will be. You refuse to understand us, gentlemen. We are for independence. Yes, for South Carolina. That is our country, and as such, we do not wish her to belong to anyone, not to England. We and intend not to, to be one nation, Rutledge. A nation of sovereign states, Mr. Adams, united for our mutual protection and separate for our individual pursuits. That is what we have understood it to be, and that is what we will support as soon as everyone supports it. Well, there you are, Mr. Adams. You must see that we need time. Time to understand who we are and where we stand in regard to one another. For if we do not determine the nature of this beast before we set it free, it will end by consuming us all. For once in your life, Wilson, take a chance. I say the time is now. It may never come again. Your clock is fast, Mr. Adams. I say we're not yet right for independence. Not right? Hell, we're rotting for want of it. Gentlemen, please. What in God's name is the infernal hurry? Why must this question be settled now? What's wrong with now, Mr. Chase? General Washington is in the field. If he's defeated, as it now appears, then we'll be inviting the hangman. But if by some miracle he does it, actually win, then we can declare anything we damn please. The sentiments of North Carolina precisely. Has it occurred to either of you that an army needs something to fight for in order to win? A cause, a purpose, a, a flag of its own. Mr. Adams, how can a nation of only two million souls stand up to an empire of 10 million? Think of it, 10 million. How do we compensate for that shortage? It's simple, Mr. Chase. Increase and multiply. <laughs> How's that? I tell you, we will more than compensate with spirit. There is a spirit out there with the people that is sadly lacking in this Congress. Yes, of course. Now it's spirit. Well, why didn't I think of that? No army, no navy, no arms, no ammunition, no friends, no treasury, but bless our soul, spirit. <laughs> Mr. Lee, Mr. Hopkins, Mr. Rodney, Colonel McKeon, Dr. Franklin. Why have you joined with this incendiary little man, this Boston radical, this agitator, this demigod, this, this madman? Are you calling me a madman? You, you fribble? Easy, John. You and your Pennsylvania proprietors, you cool, considerate men. You keep to the rear of every issue so that if we should go under, you'll still remain afloat. Are you calling me a coward? Yes. Coward! Madman! Landlord! Lawyer! Whack it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! This is a Congress! Stop it, I say! The enemy is out there! No, sir, the enemy is here! No! No! He's out there! England! England! Closing in! Cutting off our air! There's no time! There's no air! Thomas! Caesar! Caesar! Dr. Hall! Colonel McKean. Aye, it's, it's the count, sir. He should go home. Yes, a man should die in his own bed. John. I'm here, Caesar. I leave you in divided Delaware. Forgive me. Come on, Caesar. I'll take you home. John, I'll be back with you in the week. President, South Carolina moves to call the question. What's that, Mr. Rutledge? I said South Carolina moves to end debate and call the question on independence. 
Delaware seconds. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. The question has been called and seconded. Mr. Secretary, you will record the vote. Franklin, do something. Think! I am thinking. Nothing's coming. All those in favor of the resolution of independence as proposed by the colony of Virginia signify by Mr. saying... Mr. Secretary, um, would you read that resolution again? I've forgotten it. Come now. <clears throat> Resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent. I beg your pardon. I'm the Reverend John Witherspoon, new delegate from, from New Jersey. Dr. Franklin, I regret I must be the bearer of unhappy tidings, but your son, the royal governor of New Jersey, is taken prisoner and has been moved under guard to the colony of Connecticut for safekeeping. Is he unharmed, sir? When last I heard he was, yes, sir. Well, then why the long face? I understand Connecticut is an excellent location. Tell me, why'd they arrest the little bastard? Our New Jersey legislature has recalled the old delegation to this Congress and sent out a new one. Well, quickly, man, where do you stand on independence? Haven't I made that clear? No. Oh, I suppose I haven't. That's the reason for the change. We've been instructed to vote for independence. Mr. President, Massachusetts is now ready for the vote on independence and reminds the chair of its privilege in deciding all votes that are deadlocked. I won't forget, Mr. Adams. The chair would like to welcome the Reverend Witherspoon and appoint him congressional chaplain, if he will accept the post. With much pleasure, sir. Very well, Mr. Thompson, you may proceed with the vote on independence. All in favor of the resolution on independence, as proposed by the colony of Virginia, signify Mr. by saying... Pennsylvania moves that any vote in favor of independence must be unanimous. What? I second the motion. George ah. Wilson! Oh, my God. <laughs> Delaware seconds, Mr. President. Dickinson, no vote has ever had to be unanimous, and you know it. Yes, but this one must be. On what grounds? In order that no colony be torn from its mother country without its own consent. Yeah, here, here. But it'll never be unanimous, damn it! Uh, if you say so, Mr. Adams. It has been moved and seconded that a vote on independence must be unanimous in order to carry. All those in favor signify by saying yay. Yay! Six colonies say yay. All those opposed signify by saying nay. Nay! Six colonies say nay. Mr. Secretary? New York abstains, obviously. <laughs> Mr. Morris, why does New York constantly abstain? Why doesn't New York simply stay in New York? Very well, the vote is tied. The principles of independence have no greater advocate in Congress than its president. That is the reason I must join those who vote for unanimity. What? Good God, John, you sunk us! Hear me out! Don't you see that any colony that opposes independence will be forced to fight on the side of England? That we'll be setting brother against brother? That our new nation will carry as its emblem the mark of Cain? I can see no other way. Either we walk together, or together we stay where we are. <laughs> Proceed, Mr. Thompson. A unanimous vote being necessary to carry, if any be opposed to the resolution of independence as proposed by the colony of Virginia, signify by saying... Mr. President! For heaven's sake, let me get through it once! <laughs> Mr. President, I move for a postponement. <laughs> postponement? I wish you all the luck I had with it. Mr. Adams is right. We need a postponement. On what ground? On what well, Mr. President, how can this Congress vote on independence without some sort of written declaration of some kind defining it? What sort of declaration? Well, you know, listing our reasons for the separation and our goals and aims and so on and so forth, etc., etc. Ditto, ditto. Ditto, ditto. We know those, don't we? Oh, good God, yes, we know them. But what about the rest of the world? Certainly, we require the aid of a powerful nation like France or Spain, and such a declaration would be consistent with European delicacy. Come now, Mr. Adams. You'll have to do better than that. Answer straight. What would be its purpose? Yes. Well, to place before mankind the common sense of the subject in terms so plain and firm as to command their assent. <laughs> Mr. 
Jefferson. Are you seriously suggesting that we publish a paper declaring to all the world that our illegal rebellion is in reality a legal one? Mr. Dickinson, I'm surprised at you. You should know that a rebellion in the first person is always legal, such as our rebellion. It is only in the third person, their rebellion, that it is illegal. <laughs> Mr. President, I second the motion to postpone a vote on independence for a period of time sufficient for writing of a declaration. It has been moved and seconded. Mr. Secretary? All those in favor of the motion to postpone signify by saying yay. Yay. Six colonies say yay. Against? Nay. Six colonies say nay. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, New York abstains courteously. Mr. Morris, what in hell goes on in New York? I do apologize, Mr. President, but the simple fact is our legislature has never sent us explicit instruction on anything. Never? That's impossible. Have you ever been present at a meeting of the New York legislature? They speak very fast and very loud. Nobody pays any attention to anyone else, with the result being that nothing ever gets done. I do beg the Congress's pardon. My sympathies, Mr. Morris. The vote again being tied, the chair decides in favor of the postponement. So ruled, a committee will be formed to manage the declaration, said document to be written, debated, and approved by the beginning of July, three weeks hence at which time Virginia's resolution on independence will finally be voted. Is that clear? Yes, yes, Mr. Yes, President. Yes, yes. Very well. Will the following gentlemen serve on the Declaration Committee? Dr. Franklin, Mr. John Adams, Mr. Sherman, Mr. Livingston, and of course, Mr. Lee. Oh. Excuse me, huh? but I must be returning to the sovereign country of Virginia, for I have been asked to serve as governor. Therefore, I must decline. Respectful, Lee. Very well, Mr. Lee, you're excused. Uh, just a minute. Mr. President, this business needs a Virginian. Therefore, I propose a replacement. Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Uh, no, Mr. Adams. Very no. well, Mr. Adams. Mr. Jefferson will but serve. I'm going home Move to, to, to my wife. No, wait. Second. I haven't seen her Move in six seconds. months. Seconded. Any objections? I have objections. So many Thomas objections. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, let's get on with it. Which one of us will write a Declaration of Independence? Mr. Adams, I say you should write it. To your legal mind and brilliance we defer. Is that so? Well, if I'm the one to do it, they'll run their quill pens through it. I'm obnoxious and disliked, you know that, sir. Yes, I know. And I say you should write it, Franklin. Yes, you. Hell no. Yes, you, Dr. Franklin. You, but, you, but, you, but, Mr. Adams. But, Mr. Adams, the things I write are only light extemporanea. I won't put politics on paper, it's a mania. So I refuse to use the pen in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. Mr. Sherman, I say you should write it. You are never controversial, as it were. That is true. Whereas if I'm the one to do it, they'll run their quill pens through it. I'm obnoxious and disliked, you know that, sir? Yes, I do. Then I say you should write it, Roger. Yes, you. Evans, no. Yes, you, Roger Sherman. You, but, you, but, you. Mr. Adams, but Mr. Adams, I cannot write with any style of proper etiquette. I don't know a preposition from a predicate. I am just a simple cobbler from Connecticut. Connecticut.
Mr. Livingston, maybe you should write it. You have many friends and you're a diplomat. Oh, that word. Whereas if I'm the one to do it, they'll run their quill pens through it. He's obnoxious and disliked. Did you know that? I hadn't heard. Then I say you should write it, Robert. Yes, you. Not me, Johnny. Yes, you, Robert Livingston. You. But you. But you. But Mr. Adams. Dear Mr. Adams, I've been presented with a new son by the noble stork. So I'm going home to celebrate at Papa Cork with all the Livingstons together back in old New York. New York. Jefferson. But Mr. Adams, I haven't seen my wife. And in we six solemnly declare that we will preserve our liberties, being with one mind resolved to die free men rather than to live slaves. Thomas Jefferson, on the necessity of taking up arms, 1775. Magnificent. You write ten times better than any man in Congress including me. For a man of only 33 years, you have a happy talent of composition and a remarkable felicity of expression. Now then, will you be a patriot or a lover? A lover? No! But I burn, Mr. A. Oh yeah? So do I. Mr. J? You do? John! Who'd have thought it still? <laughs> Mr. Jefferson, dear Mr. Jefferson, I'm only 41, I still have my virility. And I can romp through Cupid's Grove with great agility. But life is more than sexual combustibility. Combustibility, combustibility, It, Mr. J. And who will make me, Mr. A? I. You? Yes. How? <laughs> By physical force, if necessary. It's your duty. It's your duty, damn it. Mr. Adams, damn you, Mr. Adams. You're obnoxious and disliked, that cannot be denied. Once again, you stand between me and my lovely bride. Oh, Mr. Adams, you are driving me to homicide. Homicide, homicide. The choice is yours, Mr. Jefferson. Do as you like with it. We may see
Is it done? Can I see it? <laughs> there comes a time in the lives of men when it becomes necessary to advance from that subordination in which they have hitherto remained. This is terrible. Where's the rest of it? You mean to say it's not yet finished? I mean to say it's not begun. Good God! Jefferson, you had a whole week! The entire Earth was created in a week! Well, someday you must tell me how you did it! <laughs> Disgusting. Franklin, look at him. Virginia's most famous lover. Virginia abstains. Oh, cheer up, Jefferson. Get out of the dumps. It'll come out right, I promise now. Get back to work. Franklin, tell him to get back to work. He's asleep. Oh, you, this little girl are you. <laughs> John, who is she? His wife. I hope. <laughs> what makes you think so? Because I sent for her. You what? Well, it simply occurred to me that the sooner his problem was solved, the sooner our problem would be solved. Oh, good thinking, John. Good thinking. <laughs> Madam, may I present myself, John Adams. Adams? John Adams? And Dr. Franklin, inventor of the stove. <laughs> Jefferson, will you kindly present me to your wife? She is your wife, isn't she? Oh, of course she is. Look how well they fit. <clears throat> well, come along, John. Come along. Come along where? There's work to be done. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Good God. You mean they? They're going to in the middle of the afternoon. Not everyone's from Boston, John. Incredible. Well, good night, John. Well, have you eaten yet, Franklin? Well, not yet. I hear the turkey's fresh with a bunch of grapes. I have a rendezvous, John. I'd invite you along, but talking makes me nervous. <laughs> Incredible. Huh. Oh, Abigail. Abigail, I am very lonely. Are you, John? And as long as you were sending for wives, why didn't you send for your own? Don't be unreasonable, Abigail. Now I'm unreasonable. You'll have to add that to your list. List? The catalog of my faults that you included in your last letter. They were fondly intended, madam. That I play at cards badly. A compliment. That my posture is crooked. An endearment. That I read, write, and think too much. An irony. That I'm pigeon-toed. Ah, well, there you have me, Abby. I'm afraid you are, Pigeon Toad. Come to Philadelphia, Abigail, please. Come. Thank you, John. I do want to. But you know it's not possible now. The children have the measles. Yes, so you wrote, Tom and little Abby. Only now it's Quincy and Charles. And it appears the farm here in Braintree is failing, John. The chickens and geese have all died. And the apples never survived the late frost. How do you suppose she managed to get away? The winters are softer in Virginia. And their women, John? Fit for Virginians, madam, but pale, puny things beside New England girls. John, I thank you for that. And how goes it with you, Abigail? Not well, John. Not at all well. I live like a nun in a cloister, solitary celibate. I hate it. And you, John? I live like a monk in an abbey. Ditto, ditto, I hate it. Write to me with sentimental effusion. Let me revel in romantic illusion. Do you still smell of vanilla and spring hair and is my favorite 
lover's pillar still firm and fair. What was there, John? Still is there, John? Come soon as you can to my cloister. I've forgotten the feel of your hands. Soon, madam, we shall walk in Cupid's Grove together. And we'll fondly survey that promised land. mind first thing in the morning Franklin dare we call a congressman dares anything go ahead me your voice is more piercing well maybe we ought to come back later what well it's positively indecent oh John they're young and in love not them Franklin us standing out here waiting for them to you know what will people think oh don't worry about it John the history books will clean it up <laughs> It doesn't matter, I won't appear in the history books. Only you. Franklin did this. Franklin did that. Franklin did some other damn thing. Franklin smoked the ground and out sprang George Washington, fully grown and on his horse. Franklin then electrified him with his magnificent lightning rod. And all three of them, Franklin, Washington, and the horse, conducted the entire revolution all by themselves. I like it. <laughs> oh. Look at her, John. Just look at her. I am. Well, she's even more magnificent than I remember. Of course, we didn't see much of her front last night. <laughs> Good morrow, madam. Good morrow. Isn't the habit in Philadelphia for strangers to shout at ladies from the street? Not at all, madam, but we're not strangers. And for men of your age, it's not only unseemly, it's unsightly. Excuse me, madam, but we met last evening. I spoke to no one last evening. Indeed you did not, madam, but nevertheless, we presented ourselves. This is Mr. John Adams, and I am Dr. Franklin, the inventor of the stove. <laughs> oh, please, I know your names very well, but... You say you presented yourselves? Oh, well, it's of no matter, madam. Your thoughts were well taken elsewhere. <laughs> um, uh, my husband is not yet up. Well, shall we start over? W would you join us, madam? Yes, of course. No wonder the man couldn't write. Who could think of independence married to her? <laughs> I beg you to forgive me, gentlemen. It is indeed an honor meeting the two a greatest men in America. Well, the greatest within earshot, anyway. I am not an idle flatterer, Dr. Franklin. My husband admires you both greatly. Then we are doubly flattered, for we admire very much that which your husband admires. <laughs> Did you sleep well, madam? I, I mean, did, did you did, did you lie comfortably? <laughs> Damn, you know what I mean. Yes, John, we do. Well, tell us about yourself, madam. We've had precious little information. What's your first name? Martha. Oh, Martha. He might have at least told us that. I'm afraid your husband doesn't say very much. He's the most silent man in Congress. I've never heard him utter three sentences together. Not everyone's a talker, John. It's true, you know. Tom is not a talker. 
Oh, he never speaks his passions, he never speaks his views, whereas other men speak volumes. The man I love is mute. In truth, I can't recall being wooed with words at all, even now. Go on, madam. Yes, how did he win you, Martha? And how does he hold on to a bounty such as you? Surely you know that Tom is a man of many accomplishments. Author, lawyer, farmer, architect, statesman, and uh, still one more that I hesitate no, to no, mention. No, 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 don't hesitate, madam. Don't, don't, don't hesitate. Yes, what else could that red-headed tombstone do? He plays the violin. He tucks it right under his chin. And he bows, oh, he bows, for he knows, yes, he knows, that it's high, 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 diddle, diddle, to wake my heart, Tom and his fiddle, my strings are unstrung. High, 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 high. said John. We're taking up the violin. Very well, madam. You've got us playing the violin. What happens next? Next, Mr. Adam? Yes. What does Tom do now? Why, just what you'd expect. We dance! That's incredible! Who's playing the violin? John, really? my wife back to bed, kindly go away. <laughs> Your obedient, T. Jefferson. Perhaps I am the one who should have written the declaration after all. At my age, there's little doubt that the pen is mightier than the sword. For it's high, 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 diddle, diddle, and God bless the man who can fiddle. Independency. I, 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 through eternity, he plays the violin, the violin, the violin. 
and what follows is a complete and up-to-date list of this committee of the Congress now sitting, about to sit, or just having sat. <coughs> A committee formed to investigate a complaint made against the quality of yeast manufactured at Mr. Henry Pendleton's mill, designated as the Yeast Committee. A committee formed to consider the most effective method of dealing with spies, designated as the Spies Committee. A committee formed to think, perhaps to do, but in any case to gather, to meet, to confer, to talk, and perhaps even to resolve that each rival regiment be allowed at least one drum and one fife attached to each company, designated as the Drum and Fife Committee. A committee formed Look to... at it, Dr. Democracy. What Plato called a charming form of government full of variety and disorder. I never knew Plato had been to Philadelphia. <laughs> Mayor, open a damn window. Ben, I'd like you to see some cards I've gone and printed up, uh, which ought to save a whole lot of time and effort for everybody here, considering the epidemic of bad dispositions that's been going around lately. Dear sir, you are, without any doubt, a rascal, a rogue, a villain, a thief, a scoundrel, and a mean, dirty, stinking, sniveling, sneaking, pipping, pocket-picking, thrice, double-damn, no-good son of a bitch! And you sign your name. What do you think? <laughs> Stephen, I'll take a dozen right now! <laughs> a committee formed to answer all congressional correspondence, designated as the Congressional Correspondence Committee. All right, Franklin, enough socializing. There's work to be done. Good morning, John. Yes, good morning, good morning, good morning. Now then, let's get to it. Let's get to what? Unanimity, of course. Look at this board. Six nays to win over in a little more than a week. A committee formed to consider the problem of counterfeit money, designated as the Counterfeit Money Committee. All right, John, where do we start? How about Delaware? It's a sad thing to find her on the wrong side after all this time. Have you heard any news of Rodney? McKeon's back. Thomas, Thomas. A committee formed to study the causes of our military defeat in Canada, designated as the Military Defeat Committee. How did you leave Caesar? Is he still alive? Aye. But the journey to Dover was fearful hard on him. He never complained, but I could tell the poor man was suffering. But you got him safely home. I did. But I doubt he'll ever set foot out of it again. Well, that leaves you and Reed split down the middle. Will he come over? I don't know. He's a stubborn little snot. Then work on him, McKee. Keep at him until you wear him down. Oh, but what's the point? If it were just Reed standing in our way, it wouldn't be so bad. But look for yourself, man. Maryland, Pennsylvania, the entire South. It's impossible. It's impossible if we stand around complaining about it, McKeon. To work, one foot in front of the other. Oh, I believe I put it a better way. Never leave off Shut till up, tomorrow. Franklin. That which you can. Oh, face facts, will ya? You know Dickinson, he'll never give in. And you haven't heard the last of Rutledge, neither. Never mind about them. Your job is George Reed. Talk him deaf if you have to, but bring us back Delaware. There is a simpler way. This'll break the tie. <laughs> All right, John. <laughs> Who's next? A committee formed to keep secrets, designated as the <clears throat> Secrets Committee. Pennsylvania and Maryland. I suggest you try to put your own house in order while I take a crack at little turkey face. Ah, <laughs> oh, Mr. Chase. How about it, Chase? When are you going to come to your senses? Please, Mr. Adams, not while I'm eating. Mr. Wilson, it's time you assert yourself. When you were a judge, how the hell did you ever make a decision? All the decisions I made were based on legality and precedent. But there is no legality here, and there is certainly no precedent. Because it's a new idea, you clot. We'll be setting our own precedent. No, Mr. McKean. No, no, no. Damn your eyes, Reed. You came into the world screaming no, and you're determined to leave it the same way. The entire Congress is waiting on you, Chase. America's waiting. The whole world is waiting. Do you have to put the whole thing in your mouth? <laughs> Leave me alone, Mr. Adams. You're wasting your time. If I thought we could actually win this war, I'd be at the front of your ranks. But you must know it's impossible. You've heard General Washington's dispatches. His army has fallen apart. Washington is exaggerating the situation in order to arouse this torpid Congress into action. Why, as chairman of the War Committee, I can tell you for a fact that the Army has never been in better shape. Never have soldiers been more resolute. Uh, never have troops been more cheerful. Never have discipline and training been... Good God. Hey, 
May we have your ears, gentlemen. Mr. Thompson has a dispatch. From the commander, Army of the United Colonies in New York, dispatch number 1,157. To the Honorable Congress, John Hancock, President. Dear sir, it is with the utmost despair that I must report to you the confusion and disorder that reign in every department. The Continental Soldier is as nothing ever seen in this or any other century. He is a misfit, ignorant of hygiene, destructive, disorderly, and totally disrespectful of rank. Only this last is understandable, as there is an incredible reek of stupidity amongst the officers. The situation is most desperate at the New Jersey training ground in New Brunswick, where every able-bodied whore in the colonies has assembled. There are constant reports of drunkenness, desertion, foul language, naked bathing in the Raritan River, and an epidemic of the French disease. I have declared the town off-limits to all military personnel, with the exception of officers. I beseech the Congress to dispatch the War Committee to this place in the hope of restoring some of the order and discipline we need to survive. Your obedient servant. G. Washington. Oh, that man could depress a hyena. Well, Mr. Adams, you're chairman of the War Committee. Are you up to whoring, drinking, deserting, and New Brunswick? There must be some mistake. I have an aunt who lives in New Brunswick. <laughs> well, you must tell her to keep up the good work. <laughs> come, come, Mr. Adams. You must see that this is helpless. Let us recall General Washington and disband the Continental Army before we are overwhelmed. Oh, the English would like that, wouldn't they? Well, why don't you ask them yourself? They are to be here any minute. And when they do hang you, Mr. Adams, I do hope you'll put in a good word for the rest of us. Face facts, Mr. Adams. A handful of drunk and disorderly recruits against the entire British Army, made up of the finest musket men on the world. How can we win? How can we even hope to survive? Answer me straight, Chase. If you thought we could beat the Redcoats, would Maryland say yay to independence? Well. I suppose. Don't suppose, Chase. Would you or wouldn't you? <clears throat> Very well. Yes, we would. Then come with me to New Brunswick and see for yourself. John, are you mad? You heard what Washington said. It's a shambles up there. John, they're pushing you into it. What do you say, Chase? <coughs> Go ahead, Sam. It sounds lively as hell up there. <laughs> All right. Why not? It may well be John Adams who comes to his senses. Mr. President, the War Committee will heed General Washington's request. A party consisting of Mr. Chase, Dr. Franklin, and myself will leave immediately for New Brunswick. Is that satisfactory with you, Dr. Franklin? Wake up, Franklin! Oh. You're going to New Brunswick. Like hell I am. What for? The whoring and the drinking. <laughs> Come on, turkey boy. Let's go. Left, right, left, right. I'm sure they have turkey in New Brunswick. I hear the Reverend's aunt is cooking. <laughs> Mr. McNair. Well, this talk of independence has left a certain foulness in the air. My friends and I would appreciate it if you could open some windows. What about the flies? The windows, Mr. McNair. Open the windows. Close the windows. Sweet Jesus. Oh, see, do you see what I see? Congress sitting here in sweet serenity. I could cheer the reasons clear. For the first time in a year, Adams isn't here. And look, the sun is in the sky. A breeze is blowing by, and there's not a single fly. I sing Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna. Come, ye cool, cool, come 
conservative men How like may never ever be seen again We have land, cash in hand Self-command, future plan Fortune thrives, society survives In neatly ordered lives With well-endowed wives Come sing Hosanna, Hosanna In our breeding and our manner We are cool Come ye cool, cool Consider it set We'll dance together to the same minuet to the right, ever to the right, never to the left, forever to the right. Let our creed be never to exceed, regulated speed, no matter what the need. Come sing Hosanna, Hosanna. Emblazoned on our banner is keep I have a new dispatch. From the commander, Army of the United Colonies in New York. Dispatch number 1,158. <clears throat> to the Honorable Congress, John Hancock, President. Dear sir, I awoke this morning to find that General Howe has landed 25,000 British regulars and Hessian mercenaries on Staten Island, and that the fleet, under the command of his brother, Admiral Lord Howe, controls not only the Hudson and East Rivers, but New York Harbor, which now looks like all of London afloat. I can no longer in good conscience withhold from the Congress my certainty that the British military object at this time is Philadelphia. <coughs> Happy should I be if I could see the means of preventing them, but at present I confess I do not. Oh, how I wish I had never seen this Continental Army. I would have done better to retire in the back country and live in a wigwam. Your obedient servant. G. Washington. What we do, we do rationally. We never ever go off half caught, not we. Why we did to remember we can win. And if we cannot win, why bother to begin? They say this game's not of our choosing. Why should we risk losing? Cool, cool man. Mr. Hancock, you're a man of property, one of us. Why don't you join us in our minuet? Why do you persist on dancing with Mr. Adams? Good Lord, sir, you don't even like him. That is true, he annoys me quite a lot, but still I'd rather trot to Mr. Adams' new gavotte. But why, sir? For personal glory? For a place in history? Be careful, sir. History will brand Mr. Adams and his followers as traitors. <laughs> traitors to what, Mr. Dickinson? The British crown or the British half crown? Fortunately, there are not enough men of property in America to dictate policy. Well, perhaps not. But don't forget that most men with nothing would rather protect the possibility of becoming rich rather than face the reality of being poor. And that is why they will follow us. To the right, ever to the right, ever to the left, forever to the right. Where there's gold, the bucket that will hold, tradition that is old, we love them to be gold. Come sing Hosanna.
How'd you like to try to borrow a dollar from one of them? <laughs> Another wrong, General? General? Lord, I ain't even a corporal. Nah. What's the Army know? <clears throat> ah, sit down, gentlemen. The chair rules. It's too damn hot to work. So, what's it like out there, General? Well, you probably know more than me. <laughs> Sitting in here? <laughs> Sweet Jesus, this is the last place to find out what's going on. I aim to join up. What do you mean, join up? You don't need to join up. You're in the Congress. What's that got to do with it? Well, you don't see any of them rushing off to get themselves killed, do you? Uh, Great ones for doing it to others, though. I'll tell you that. Who sits in this chair here? Caesar Rodney, Delaware. Where are you from, General? Watertown. Where's that? Massachusetts. Ah. Well, you'll be over here, but be careful. There's something about that chair that makes a man mighty noisy. You see any fighting? I sure did. I saw my two best friends get shot dead. There the same day. Right there on the village green, it was too. And when they didn't come home for supper, then Mamas went looking for him. Miss Lowell, she found Timothy right off. Miss Pickett, she she was out the whole night looking for William because he had gone and crawled off the green before he died. Mama, hey, mama, come looking for me. I'm here in the meadow by the red maple tree. Mama, hey, mama, look sharp, here I be. Hey. To the sky Is that you I'm hearing In the tall grass Nearby Oh mama Come find me Before I do Die Hey, hey Mama Look sharp
Secretary will now read the report of the Declaration Committee. Mr. Thompson. A declaration by the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Jefferson! Jefferson, we are back! And we've got Maryland. That is, we will, just as soon as Turkey Face tells the Maryland Assembly what we saw in New Brunswick. He's in Annapolis right now, describing a ragtag coalition of provincial militiamen who couldn't drill together, march together, train together. But when a flock of ducks flew by and they saw their first dinner in three full days, sweet Jesus, could they shoot together? It was a slaughter. <laughs> They're reading the declaration. What? How far have they got? To render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. Independent of and superior to? There's nothing to fear. It's a masterpiece. I'm to be congratulated. You? For making him write it. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. It's a masterpiece, I say. They will cheer every word, every letter. I wish I felt that way. I believe I can put it better. Now then attend as friend to friend our declaration committee. For us I see mortality in Philadelphia City. A farmer, a lawyer, and a sage, a vicary in the lake. You know it's quite bizarre to think that here we are, playing midwives to an egg. Egg? What egg? America, the birth of a new nation. If only we could be so sure as to what kind of bird it would be. Oh, Tom has a point. What sort of bird do we want as the symbol of our new America? The eagle. The dove. The turkey. <laughs> the eagle. The dove. The eagle. The dove. The turkey. The eagle is a majestic bird. The eagle is a scavenger, a thief, and a coward, and a symbol of more than 10 centuries of European mischief. And the turkey? A truly noble bird, a native of America, a source of sustenance to our settlers, and an incredibly brave fellow who would not flinch from fighting an entire regiment of Englishmen single-handedly. Therefore, the national bird of America is going to be... The eagle! The, the eagle. <laughs> We're waiting for the chirp, chirp, chirp. Of an eaglet being born, waiting for the chirp, 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 on this humid Monday morning in this congressional incubator. God knows the temperature's hot enough to hatch a stone, let alone an egg. We're waiting for the scratch, scratch, scratch of that tiny little fellow waiting for the egg to hatch on this humid Monday morning in this congressional incubator. God knows the temperature's hot enough to hatch a stone. What about an egg? The Declaration will be a triumph, I tell you, a triumph! If I am sure of anything, I am sure of that! And if it isn't, well, at least we have four more days to think of something else. The eagle's gonna crack the shell of the egg that England laid. Yes, sir, we can tell, tell, tell on this humid Monday morning in this congressional incubator. And just as Tom here has written, though the shell may belong to Great Britain, the eagle inside belongs to us. And just as Tom here has written, we say to hell with Great Britain, the eagle inside belongs to us.
and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may have right to. And for the support of this declaration, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. The Congress has heard the report of the Declaration Committee. Are there any who wish to offer amendments, deletions, or alterations to the Declaration? Mr. President! Mr. Mayor, you'd better open a window. Colonel McKean, I saw your hand first. Tom, that's a bonny paper you've written there. But somewhere in it you've mentioned Scottish and foreign mercenaries sent to destroy us. Scottish, Tom! It's in reference to a Highland regiment that stood against us at Boston. Oh, it was probably just Germans wearing kilts to try and confuse us. <laughs> I ask that you remove the word to avoid giving offense to a good people. Mr. Jefferson? Mr. President, Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Jefferson, nowhere do you mention the Supreme Being. Certainly this was an oversight. Or how could we hope to achieve a victory without his help? Therefore, I must humbly suggest the following addition to your final sentence with a firm alliance on the protection of divine providence. Mr. Reed. Among your charges against the King, Mr. Jefferson, you accuse him of depriving us of the benefits of trial by jury. This is untrue, sir, though where we've always had trial by jury. In Massachusetts, we have not. Oh, then I suggest the words, in many cases, be added. Mr. Jefferson? Oh, in many cases. Brilliant! I suppose every time you hear those three little words, your puny little chest will swell with pride over your great historical contribution. It's more memorable than your unprincipled whitewash of that race of barbarians. Mr. Reed, Colonel McKean, that's enough. Mr. Hopkins. No objections, John. I'm just trying to get a drink. I might have known. McNair. Mr. Bartlett. Mr. Jefferson, I beg you to remember that we still have friends in England. I see no purpose in antagonizing them with such phrases as unwilling brethren or enemies in war. Our quarrel is with the British king, not the British people. Be sensible, Bartlett. Remove those phrases and the entire paragraph becomes meaningless. And it just so happens that they're among the most poetic and stirring of any passage in the entire document. We are a Congress, Mr. Adams, not a literary society. I ask that the entire paragraph be stricken. Mr. Jefferson? Good God! Jefferson, don't you ever intend to speak up for your own work? I had hoped it would speak for itself. Mr. Hancock. What is it, Mr. McNair? You know, I can't say that I'm very fond of the United States of America as a name for a new country. I don't care what you're fond of, Mr. McNair. You're not a member of this Congress. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President. Brother Jefferson, I noted at least two distinct and direct references to the British Parliament in your declaration. Uh, do you think it wise that we alienate this august body and in light of our contention that they have never had any direct authority over us anyway? This is a revolution, damn it! We're gonna have to offend somebody! John! John, you'll have an attack of apoplexy if you're not careful. Have you heard what they're doing to it, Franklin? Have you heard? Yes, John, I've so heard. Some parts have been our friends. Could you imagine what our enemies are gonna do? The word parliament will be removed wherever it occurs. They won't be satisfied until they remove one of the Fs from Jefferson's name. Courage, <laughs> John. It won't last much longer. Mr. Dickinson. Mr. Jefferson, I have very little interest in your paper, as there's no doubt in my mind that we've all but heard the last of it. But I am curious about one thing. Why do you refer to King George as a tyrant? Because he is a tyrant. 
I remind you, sir, that this tyrant is still your king. When a king becomes a tyrant, he thereby breaks the contract binding him to his subjects. How so? By taking away their rights. Rights that came from him in the first place. All but one, Mr. Dickinson. The right to be free comes from nature. <clears throat> Mr. Wilson, do we in Pennsylvania consider King George a tyrant? I, well, I don't know. I, no, no, we don't. He's not a tyrant in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Here you are, Mr. Jefferson. Your declaration does not speak for us all. I demand the word tyrant be removed. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Thompson. I do not consent. The king is a tyrant whether we say so or not. We might as well say so. But I already scratched it out. Then scratch it back in. Put it back, Mr. Thompson. The king will remain a tyrant. <laughs> Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. Hughes. Now, Mr. Jefferson, nowhere do you mention deep sea fishing rights. We in North Carolina. Good God! Fishing rights! How long is this piddling to go on? We have been sitting here for three full days, and we have endured, by my count, 85 separate changes and the removal of close to 400 words. Would you whip and beat it till you break its spirit? I tell you, this document is a masterful expression of the American mind. If there are no more objections, then, can I assume the report of the Declaration Just Committee? Just a moment, Mr. President. Look out. I wonder if we could prevail on Mr. Thompson to read a certain portion of Mr. Jefferson's declaration. The one beginning, uh, he has waged cruel war. Mr. Thompson. <clears throat> He has affected, he has combined, he has abdicated, he has plundered, he has constrained, he has excited, he has incited, he has waged cruel war. Ah, here it is. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, determined to keep an open market where men should be bought and sold. He has prostituted... That will suffice, Mr. Thompson. I thank you. Mr. Jefferson. I can't quite make out what it is you're talking about. Slavery, Mr. Rutledge. Ah, and you are referring to us as slaves of the king. No, Mr. Rutledge, I'm referring to our slaves. Black slaves. Oh. Black slaves. Well, why didn't you say so, sir? Were you trying to hide your meaning? No, sir. Just a bit of literary license there. If you like. I don't like, Mr. Jefferson. For we in South Carolina, slavery is our peculiar institution and cherished way of life. Nevertheless, we must abolish it. Nothing is more certainly written in the Book of Faith than that these people shall be free. I'm not particularly concerned with what's written in the Book of Fate, sir. I'm more concerned with what's written in your little paper there. That little paper there deals with freedom for Americans. <laughs> ah, and Mr. Adams sees our black slaves as Americans, are they now? They are. They're people. And they're here. If there's any other requirement, I've never heard of it. Well... They are here, sir, but they are not people. They are property. No, Mr. Rutledge. They're people who are treated as property. I tell you, the rights of human nature are deeply wounded by this infamous practice. Then tend to your own wounds, Mr. Jefferson, for you are a practitioner, are you not? I have resolved to release my slave. Then I'm sorry, you have also resolved the ruination of your personal economy. Economy. <laughs> Always economy. There's a lot more to this than a filthy purse string, Rutledge. It's an offense against man and God. It's a stinking business, Mr. Rutledge. A stinking business. Oh. Is it now, Mr. Hopkins? 
Then what's thy smell floating down from the north? <laughs> Is it the aroma of hypocrisy? For who holds the other end of that filthy purse string, Mr. Adams? Our northern brethren feeling a little tender toward our slaves. They don't own slaves. Oh, no. But they are willing to be considerable carriers of slaves to others. Or haven't you heard, Mr. Adams? They are willing for the shilling. Clink, clink. Alasses, too wrong to slaves. Oh, what a beautiful waltz. You dance with us, we dance with you. In molasses and rum and slaves Who sail the ships out of Boston Laden with Bibles and rum Who drinks a toast to the Ivory Coast Hail Africa, the slavers have come New England with Bibles and rum then it's off with the rum and the Bibles. Take on the slaves, clink, clink. Then hail and farewell to the smell of the African coast. Molasses to rum to slaves. Tisn't morals, tis money. That says, shall we dance to the sound of the profitable pound in molasses and rum and slaves? Who sail the ships out of Guinea laden with Bibles and slaves? This Boston can boast to the West Indies coast. Jamaica, we brought what ye craves. Antigua, Barbados, we brought Bibles and slaves. Gentlemen, you mustn't think our northern friends merely see our slaves as figures on the ledger. Oh, no. They see them as figures on the block. White faces on African wards. Put them on the ships. Cram them in the snow. No. Stuff them in the ships! Gentlemen, do you hear? Let the auction begin! Yaha! Yaha! Kanda! Gentlemen, do you hear? That's the roar of the auctioneer! Yaha! Mr. Rutledge, please. Oh, 
fortunes are made in the triangle trade. Hail slavery! The New England dream. Mr. Adams, I offer you a toast. Hail Boston. Hail Charleston. Who stinketh the Mr. Rutledge, Mr. Hughes, Dr. Hall. Don't worry, John, they'll be back. I to vote us down. It's done. Adams Franklin, I have it. And the Maryland Assembly's approved it. I've just witnessed the greatest military engagement against a flock of. What's wrong? You'll have I to thought... forgive them, Mr. Chase. They just suffered a slight setback. And after all, what does a man profit it if he shall gain Maryland and lose the entire South? Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. <laughs> Mr. McNair. I know, the flies. No, a rum. Well, what are you all sitting around for? We're wasting time, precious time. Thomas, Thomas, I want you to ride down into Delaware. I want you to fetch back Caesar Rodney. John, are you mad? It's 80 miles on horseback, and he's a dying man. No, he's a patriot. Oh, what's the point? The South's done us in. And suppose they change their minds. Can we get Delaware without Rodney? God, what a bastardly bunch we are. Stephen, John, I want you I'm to... going to the tavern. If there's anything I can do for you there, let me know. Chase, Bartlett. What's the use, John? The vote's tomorrow morning. There's less than a full day left. Roger. Face facts, John. It's finished. I'm sorry, John. No other choice, John. The slavery clause has to go. What are you saying, Franklin? <laughs> it's a luxury we can't afford. A luxury? A half a million souls are in chains, and you call it a luxury? Maybe you should have walked out with the South. You forget yourself, sir. I founded the first anti-slavery society on Don't this continent. Don't wave your credentials at me, Franklin. Perhaps it's time you renewed them. The issue here is independence. Now, maybe you have lost sight of that fact, but I have not. How dare you jeopardize our cause when we've come this far? These men, no matter how much you disagree with them, are not ribbon clerks to be ordered about. They're proud, accomplished men, the cream of their colonies, and they and the people they represent are going to be part of this new country you hope to create. Either start learning how to live with them, or pack up and go home. In any event, stop acting like a Boston fishwife. Good God, what has happened to me? John Adams, the great John Adams, the wise man of the East. What have I come to? My law practice down the pipe? My farm mortgaged to the hilt at a stage in life when other men prosper, I'm reduced to living in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Oh, John. Abigail. Abigail. What am I going to do? Do, John? I need your help. You don't usually ask my advice. 
Well, there doesn't appear to be anyone else right now. Very well, John. What is it? The entire South has walked out of this Congress. General Washington is on the verge of total annihilation. And that precious cause for which I've labored these several years has come to nothing. And it seems, it seems I am obnoxious and disliked. Nonsense, John. That I am unwilling to face reality. Foolishness, John. That I'm pig-headed. Well, there you have me, John. I'm afraid you are pig-headed. Has it been any kind of life for you, Abigail? God knows I haven't given you much. I've never asked for more. After all, I am Mrs. John Adams. That's quite a lot for one lifetime. Is it, Abby? Just think of it, John. To be married to the man who's always first in line to be hanged. <laughs> yes, the agitator. Why? Abigail, you must tell me what it is. I've always been dissatisfied, I know that, but lately I find that I reek of discontentment. It fills my throat and floods my brain. And sometimes, sometimes I fear that there is no longer a dream, but only the discontentment. Oh, John, can you really know so little about yourself? And can you think so little of me that you think I would marry the man that you described? Have you forgotten what you used to say to me because I have it? Commitment, Abby. Commitment. There are only two types of creatures on the face of this earth. Those with a commitment and those who require the commitment of others. Do you remember, John? I remember. Mr. Adams? What? This, um... Uh... It's for you. Wait a minute. What is that? What's in that? Who sent it? Compliments of the conquered ladies coffee club and the sisterhood of the Truro synagogue and the Friday evening Baptist sewing circles and the holy Christian sisters of St. Clair. Abigail, what's in this keg? Faster than that, McNair. <laughs> Jefferson! Franklin! What are you doing out there? Get in here! John, didn't you hear what I said to you before? Oh, never mind that. Here's no, what you've got to do. I'm not even speaking to you. It's too late for that. Damn it, there's work to be done. Time's running out. Get up. Get out of your chair. Tomorrow is here, too late, too late to despair. Jefferson, talk to Rutledge, talk. If it takes all night, keep talking, talk and talk and talk. You're both Southern aristocrats. Gentlemen, if they'll listen to anyone, they'll listen to you. Franklin. Time's running out, I know, get out of my chair, do I have to talk to Wilson? Yes, you do, if it takes all night, keep talking, talk, and talk, and talk. Get him away from Dickinson, that is the only way to do it.
I'm still from Massachusetts, John. You know where I stand. I'll do whatever you say. No. You're the president of Congress, Hancock. You are a fair man. Stay that way. Tell me, Mr. Thompson, out of curiosity, do you stand with Mr. Dickinson, or do you stand with me? I stand with the general. <clears throat> Lately, I've had the oddest feeling he's been writing to me. I have been in expectation of receiving a reply on the subject of my last 15 dispatches. Is anybody there? Does anybody care? Does anybody care? You're humble and obedient. Are you hungry, John? Is anybody there? Does anybody care? Does anybody see what I see? They want me to quit. They say, John, give up the fight. Still to England I say Good night, forever good night For I have crossed the Rubicon Let the bridge be burned behind me Come what may, come what may Come in not the croakers all say will ruin I'm sorry if I startled you. I, I couldn't sleep. In trying to resolve my own dilemma, I was reminded of something that I once read. That a representative owes the people not only his industry, but his judgment. And he betrays them if he sacrifices it for their opinion. That was written by Edmund Burke a member of the British Parliament.
well, gentlemen. The Congress will now vote on Virginia's resolution on independence. Thank you for coming, Caesar, and God bless you, sir. Call the roll, Mr. Thompson, and I remind you, gentlemen, that a single nay vote will defeat the motion. Mr. Thompson. New Hampshire. New Hampshire says yay. New Hampshire says yay. Massachusetts. Massachusetts says yay. Massachusetts says yay. Rhode Island. Rhode Island says yay. Rhode Island says yay. Connecticut. Connecticut says yay. Connecticut says yay. New York. New York abstains <laughs> courteously. New York abstains courteously. <laughs> New Jersey. New Jersey says yay. New Jersey says yay. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. We're not ready yet, Mr. Secretary. We'll come back to us later. Pennsylvania passes. Delaware. Delaware. By majority vote, I says yay. Well done, sir. Delaware says yay. Maryland. Maryland says yay. Maryland says yay. Virginia. Virginia says yay. Virginia says yay. North Carolina. North Carolina yields to South Carolina. South Carolina. Well, Mr. Adams. Well, Mr. Rutledge. Mr. Adams, you must believe that I will do what I have promised to do. What do you want, Rutledge? Remove the offending passage from your declaration. If we did that, we would be guilty of what we ourselves are rebelling against. Nevertheless, remove the passage, or South Carolina will bury now and forever your dreams of independence. John, I beg you, consider what you're doing. Mark me. Franklin, <coughs> if we give in on this issue, posterity will never forgive us. Oh, you're probably right. But we won't hear a thing about it, John. We'll be long gone. Besides, what will posterity think we were? Demigods? We're men, no more, no less, trying to start a new nation against greater odds than a more generous God would have allowed. First things first, John. Independence. America. For if we don't secure that, what difference? Will the rest make? Jefferson, say something. What else is there to do? Good God. Man, you're the one who wrote it. I wrote all of it, Mr. Adams. You've got your slavery, and little good may it do you. Now vote, damn you! Mr. Adams. <coughs> Mr. Secretary, the fair colony of South Carolina votes yay. South Carolina votes yay. North Carolina votes yay. North Carolina votes yay. Georgia. Georgia says yay. Georgia says yay. Pennsylvania, second call. <clears throat> Mr. President, Pennsylvania regrets any inconvenience that such distinguished men as Adams, Franklin, and Jefferson have been put through just now. They might have kept their document intact for all the difference it will make. Mr. President, Pennsylvania... Just a moment. I ask that the delegation be polled. Dr. Franklin, don't be absurd. A poll, Mr. President. It's a proper request. Yes, it is. Poll the delegation, Mr. Thompson. Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Yay. Mr. John Dickinson. Yay. Mr. James Wilson. 
Judge Wilson. Well, there it is, Mr. Wilson. The entire question of American independence rests squarely on your shoulders. An entirely new nation, Mr. Wilson, waiting to be born or to die in birth solely on your say-so. Which is it to be, Mr. Wilson? Every map maker in the world is waiting your decision. Come down, James. Nothing has changed. We mustn't let Dr. Franklin create one of his confusions. The question is clear. Most questions are clear when someone else has to decide them. It'd be a pity for a man who's handed down hundreds of wise decisions from the bench to be remembered only for that one unwise decision he made in Congress. Come now, James. Everyone is waiting. The secretary has called for your vote. Don't push me, John. I know what you want me to do. But Mr. Adams is correct about one thing. I'm the one who'll be remembered for it. What do you mean? I'm different from you, John. I'm different from most of the men here. I don't want to be remembered. I just don't want the responsibility. Well, whether you want it or not, there's just no way of avoiding it. Not necessarily. If I go with them, I'll just be one among dozens. No one will ever remember the name of James Wilson. But if I go with you, I'll be the man who prevented American independence. I'm sorry, John, but I just didn't bargain for that. And is this how new nations are made? By a non-entity trying to preserve the anonymity he so richly deserves. Revolutions come into this world like bastard children, Mr. Dickinson. Half improvised and half compromised. Our side has provided the compromise. Now Judge Wilson is providing the rest. James. I'm sorry, John. My vote is yay. Pennsylvania says yay. The final count being 12 to none with one abstention, the resolution on independence is adopted. It's done. It's done. Mr. Thompson, is the declaration ready to be signed? It is. Then I suggest we do so. And the chair further proposes for our mutual security and protection, that no man be allowed to sit in this Congress without attaching his name to it. I'm sorry, Mr. President. I cannot, in good conscience, sign such a document. I will never stop hoping for our eventual reconciliation with England. But because, in my own way, I regard America no less than does Mr. Adams, I shall join the army and fight in her defense, even though I know that fight to be hopeless. Goodbye, gentlemen. Gentlemen of the Congress, I say ye, John Dickinson. Gentlemen, are there any objections to the declaration being approved as it now stands? Yes, Mr. Hancock, I have one. You, Mr. Adams? Mr. Jefferson, it just so happens that the word is unalienable, not inalienable. I'm sorry, Mr. Adams, but inalienable is correct. Mr. Jefferson, I happen to be a graduate of Harvard University. And I went to William and Mary. Gentlemen, Mr. please. Mr. Jefferson, will you yield to Mr. Adams' request? No, sir, I will not. Okay, fine, I'll withdraw it. <laughs> Good for you, John. I'll speak to the printer about it later. Mr. Thompson, are we ready? Mr. McNair, would you give me a hand, please? We are about to brave the storm on a skiff made of paper, and how it will end, God only knows. <laughs> That's a pretty large signature, John. 
so Fat George in London can read it without his glasses. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, step right up. Don't miss your chance to commit treason. <laughs> oh, Hancock's right. This paper is our passport to the gallows. But there's no backing out now. For if we don't hang together, we will most assuredly hang separately. <laughs> well, in my case, hanging won't be so bad. One drop and it'll all be over, just like that. But poor Reed over there, he'll be dancing a jig long after I'm gone. <laughs> Forgive me if I don't join in the merriment, gentlemen, but if we're arrested now, my name is still the only one on the damn thing. <laughs> Commander, Army of the United Colonies, <clears throat> Army of the United States, in New York, dispatch number 1,209. To the Honorable Congress, John Hancock, President, dear sir, I can now report with some certainty that the eve of battle in New York is near at hand. Toward this end, I have ordered the evacuation of Manhattan and directed our defenses to take up stronger positions on the Brooklyn Heights. At the present time, my forces consist entirely of Hazlitt's Delaware Militia and Smallwood's Marylanders, a total of 5,000 troops to stand against 25,000 of the enemy. And I begin to notice that many of them are lads under 15 and old men, none of whom could truly be called soldiers. One personal note to Mr. Lewis Morris of New York. I must regretfully report that his estates have been totally destroyed, but that I have taken the liberty of transporting Mrs. Morris and eight of the children to Connecticut and safety. The four older boys are now enlisted in the Continental Army. As I write these words, the enemy is plainly in sight beyond the river. How it will end, only Providence can direct. But dear God, what brave men I shall lose before this business ends. Your obedient servant. G. Washington. Very well. Mr. McNair, go ring the bell. Mr. President. Mr. Morris. To hell with New York. I'll sign it anyway. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Stephen, sit down. No. I'd like to remember each man's face as he signs. Very well. Mr. Thompson? <clears throat> New Hampshire, Dr. Josiah Bartlett. Massachusetts, Mr. John Adams. Rhode Island, Mr. Stephen Hopkins. Connecticut, Mr. Roger Sherman. New York, Mr. Lewis Morris. Mr. Robert Livingston. New Jersey, the Reverend Jonathan Witherspoon. Pennsylvania, Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Mr. James Wilson. Delaware. Mr. Caesar Rodney. Colonel Thomas McKeon. Mr. George Reed. Maryland, Mr. Samuel Chase. Virginia, Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Richard Henry Lee. North Carolina, Mr. Joseph Hughes. South Carolina, Mr. Edward Rutledge. 